There were so many pressures pressing on me. The economy, as you are aware, in Zimbabwe has really gone down. The departure of artists left, you know, the the community so small, the community of artists, as well as the viewers and friends of the gallery were reduced dramatically. So you had to try and adjust to that kind of phenomena. And it was very difficult and traumatic for me because this was my gallery family, you know. So every day somebody's coming to to say goodbye to you. So I found that especially to be very, very hard. And then it meant you could prepare exhibitions, but to exhibit means to show. And you want to show with the, uh, with the voice of a community, you know, that is together in doing something and that is celebrating the art, building new dreams. And you cannot do this on your own because it's an exhibition. It's a showing. And so who was I going to show? Too and with, so I've, it, it it aged me. You know, you just suddenly felt a sense of collapse, and something you know in the country itself that surrounded the gallery seemed to be, and still is on its knees. So I felt that I was in a tragic moment in Zimbabwe, more tragic than even the moment of uh, our armed struggle for independence, because then you know we had a very fierce and very uh, affirming, you know, undertaking, and we were going to do this, you know, we're going to do that, even though we were a colonized people and we were an excluded people. But we felt such a sensation of overcoming the impossible. So there were dreams, you know, and we were the dream children. And suddenly we were in this period, you, you are just perplexed, stunned, astonished. And you look outside, your, you know, in, or you go to the city center, which is where the gallery is situated, and you see such absolute and tragic poverty in people's eyes, along their brow, the cues, the lack of bread, fuel cues, you know, there is no petrol. So I thought, first, how do I get to work? Just that. How do I get there from my house to work? I, I was just, there were so many perplexing questions. What do I eat? There's no bread. There's no milly meal. And uh, I was quite shaken and shocked. And there was no one, because everybody, as I said, was living. There was no one to really talk to, especially around art, where we could say, you know, what are we going to do as artists? Is the role of the artist uh, more important and central at a moment like this or how is it? Because the artists were, had already answered that they had left, you know. So I, I, I just felt like a, a crushed pickle, you know. I, I had no feeling what I'm going to do, you know. Fundraising became very difficult because there were all these struggles between government and NGOs. Government itself had no money to give the institute. And one could not be assured of any continuity of, of anything, yeah even of uh, the community we had formed. And I'm not talking specifically about only the artists, but the community we were serving because we were very keen to take our art to the people. I had worked very hard to bring what we call township residence to the gallery. And this had been, to me, my major success, to make it popular and to make the art gallery like the place to be. And all of a sudden they can't afford the transport costs, to come to the gallery, or if they can. However, there's, the transport is not there because there's no fuel and things like that. I remember one month, I think we had 10 visitors from outside. And yet we used to have 2,000, 2,500. So if you are going to have these 10 people <laughs> coming you know, to view the exhibition, eh, you're not going to sell anything. And so the cost of putting up the exhibition besides the creativity that it has cost the artist and the imagination of the artist and, you know, all that, eh? all seemed to go to nothing. Were people not coming anymore because they couldn't afford it or because art at this period in time in Zimbabwe is not important because of the crisis? Absolutely not. Art in Zimbabwe is important. It has always been important in all times. But when I talk, for example, about international visitors whom we had lots and lots of. There was very poor publicity about Zimbabwe. They simply didn't come to the country 
And if they didn't come to the country, they couldn't come to the gallery. And those who are, who are local, as I've said, they had problems with transport. And there was an increase in, in bag snatching and all these thefts. So some people were just reluctant to go somewhere where it's like a leisure pursuit, you know. Maybe something will happen to me, you know. Or to spend money on that because they were trying to catch up with the rising costs of things. It seemed I'd come full circle. It suddenly became very elitist again, you know, to buy art or to look at art. Or, you know, it changed again. And the young township, men and women, boys and girls, you know, whom we had managed to bring together so often, simply couldn't do it, you know. So all these things were not foreseeable by myself, you know. One could not have been that prophetic. And it eats at the heart, you know, it eats at the skin. And in the end, you deteriorate in your sense of control, and responsibility and you yourself need help and it's not there and you feel like the last person on earth everything just had to be rethought and for all the things that you were thinking you had absolutely no answer especially if you are so committed to and you had been so committed for so long like I had been for six years with the gallery should I leave the gallery what will happen to it does that mean all my work which I've put in will be sustained? But you know, of course, it's impossible because that person, they might be as motivated as you were, but they might not have the resources to do it. I did not want to be a witness to that collapse because I didn't think I could survive it. One of the other factors was, of course, that your salary was worth nothing at the end. It was never, ever worth anything. I don't know if I was getting 25 US or whatever. I don't know. It was never ever really a salary that one could talk about. And my mother was always saying, you know, when I was trying to open an account somewhere, she would be pinching me and saying, you know, you have to fill your salary. Don't do that, you know. People will wonder that you really accept such a salary, you know. So I always had to subsidize my life at the gallery. But I didn't feel it because I had wings, you know. I just felt, you know, creatively. I learned so much, you know, and acquired so much understanding of creativity and such knowledge and got to know so many wonderfully talented people. So I feel immensely privileged that I had that, you know, and that I assisted a lot of people towards achieving also their goals. So I, 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 I don't regret my role, but this, however, could not go on. It even seemed cheaper for me to stay at home, you know, because I, I, I don't have fuel costs or any other costs except to just make sure I have enough potatoes in my kitchen or so, you know. And, and of course, I began to just change what kinds of ideals of living. So it became a lifestyle choice. And I thought, okay, I'm a writer. In fact, working at the gallery had stood in some ways between me and my writing, though it had enhanced it in another way. So... It seemed to me, if I go back and write full-time, I'm still contributing to, to the nation, in fact, to the international community, a cultural product of my country, you know. And so I, I stopped weighing these things up and saying which is which, you know, and just accepted that perhaps I was trying to juggle too much. And they felt, well, maybe it's time for you to rest. If you can take two years off, it might be good for you. But I decided to remain in the country. Why did you decide to stay in the country? You know, these decisions are never clear. I mean, of course, there's my family, my parents, my young brother. F some friends are still here. But w the decision is never clear, you know, when you actually, what really makes you in the end write that resignation form, whatever. But I remember I had been given a year off. First I thought, okay, I'll take a year off, see, see what happens, come back. So I went to Berlin with a year's grant. I only lasted three weeks before I was just completely homesick and felt I had to reverse this immediately. And I phoned my mother and she said, oh, do you know your secretary has resigned? I think about 10 people resigned while I was away or something. And this shocked me because I really felt, because she was such a good 
secretary administrator and i thought for her to leave like what is my cause and i thought no i have to go back then i, I also got a message that the ceiling of the one of the rooms of the gallery had collapsed well i couldn't sleep anymore in berlin you understand and so i had to come back i mean it's just emotion and so i came back not knowing okay what does that mean you know coming back i had not thought of re- of this and then when i came back and reviewed the situation i realized that really everything was just so it was so messy and i was not the one to fix it my coming from berlin was not going to fix the ceiling or to bring back all these fantastic people i had trained you know i felt dislocated and it was apparent to me that i better pursue my no- my novelist career Zimbabwe is living through a crisis at the moment. Do you feel it's the role of the art, of artists to go ahead and denounce what's going on at the moment? I don't know about denouncing because to denounce is to abandon in some way or it is to corrode something or someone. And there should be no prescriptions for artists. I would never be one to say artists should say this or say that or do this or do, or do that. Any prescription you know i remember marichara saying i want the maximum space around my typewriter maximum space you know and an artist must be given that liberty to to explore whatever subject they wish no matter what the times are so i simply think that sometimes you cannot escape the times you are living in and the percolates into your work and i have you know written about things which have happened in Zimbabwe like the book called the stone virgins not because i thought it was my task to do so but because i felt a deep inspiration to do it i think an artist has the privilege of being on the margin and of looking in of course i mean i i, I don't have a, an absolute answer for this i mean i, I am i saying that uh, artists should stand aside and watch a holocaust no i'm not saying this you know My friend Changer I Hobe for example is in France now. He was writing very uh, harshly against government even before things became as bad as they are. But eventually according to him he had to flee and go and live in France. And I'm writing back and forth with him now. He's uh, feeling very lost, solitary, uh, misunderstood, yet feeling some justification. I told you people and you thought you know I was crazy or someone had bought me uh, bought my head the whites had bought my head and I I done this you know but indeed you are living through the times I I had projected yeah I have a strong fear of living in exile personally to be honest with you I spent almost 10 years living in Canada and I don't really wish to go back because I've already spent 10 years of of what is a, really a human life is quite short i can go back to canada it seems to me not very creative use of my life span you know and if i lose the vision and the space which i'm inhabiting now in zimbabwe would i still write the same i have friends like nuruddin farah who believe that uh, they can write from anywhere they just need a room and a desk and a glass of water you know and they will write as though they are in their homeland but i can't i have to see you know and sense memorable and tangible things that you, you that that come to you as you observe people and the pain that that you harbor as you watch them as you participate in a life with them this morning i gave a lift to two women for example when i was going into town you know they tried to give me money and i said no there, there's no need there's no need for that i'm giving you a lift because transport is difficult they were almost in tears you understand and for me i'm almost in tears because i'm thinking what what have i done i'm one person in a car which can take four people and yeah these women just struggling to survive and then i was very moved because then they they asked me for my totem oh what is your totem so i tell them okay i say my last name is vera and one of the women says Are you Vera who who writes? I said yes and she grins you know she's happy. And then I'm happy because I'm thinking people are, take seriously writing. These were women who are obviously poor 
going maybe to the market to try and do something. But they know about things in their culture. And I felt people, just ordinary people to whom I give lift, you know, they know that there is a writer called Yvonne Vera, isn't it? So that's my community. As a writer, therefore, it is my, it is my role to absorb and synthesize those experiences that are at the ground. One time I, I gave a woman, I bought avocado from her from the streets and she started dancing, dancing, just dancing with a laughter that was like, she was just like a unique being, you know. She, she danced in it like a locust, you know what I'm saying? And I just loved this woman, old woman, you know, she had so many rags around her, but she just felt she was specially chosen, just that. And yet there's a pathos to this, you know. There's something very painful and devastating. And I come home, I lie down, you know, like for four hours, and I replay this woman, you know, and her manner and her ways and her laughter and her, her tying up of her robes and things like that, yeah? Until my mother just says, hey, can you please just stop this, you know? My problem is I can't even uh, understand it properly to give it a name. To, to comment on it. And that's my level of thinking and feeling. And if I met the president today, I, I would have no advice for him except to ask him to walk the streets I've walked.